Yes. Yes. Sir, Dr. Nankishwar here. Yes, please explain uh, for this patient. Sir, so, uh, before that, I would like to say that this case is going to take place in OT4. Yeah, yeah, that uh, I have already told the technician. We, we, we are having a picture. Yeah. We are seeing no, the picture. The video has not yet been started. No, but we are seeing all of you talking. I can see you talking. <laughs> Sir. Yeah. Uh, this is the case of uh, the 49 year old male. Yeah. Presenting with complaints of forces of voice since the last one and a half years. Yeah. And he had a history of tuberculosis about 25 to 30 years back. But pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. Yeah. Exactly. And he hasn't had any major surgeries. Uh, like next surgery, this thyroid surgery, and the examination has revealed left vocal cord paralysis. Yeah. So that's what he's going to do. Uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Monier wants to see, see the larynx first. Yeah. And after that, uh, even if you say whether to inject the crown or what is to be done with this patient. Yeah. You will examine it by uh, endoscope, yes. the larynx. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you would like to speak to Monier, he's there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, no, I, we can't hear you. I would like to play this is this is a good stitch for the second stitch. Yeah. Because you know if you, if you want to, to bring now I could insert quite nicely, I mean the thread into the needle. But if I do that uh, now I will have uh, the tremendous difficulty in doing the same thing in the subclotic area. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change the position and go a bit deeper. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, this is uh, excuse me, Professor Pusar Karsa. Right. So, we want okay. to see where is inserted that needle from outside. That we want to. Yes. 
we, it is program. only please, inside. Please show us also the external point where you have inserted. Yes. Okay. Uh, we need a camera from the outside. We, I, I am not sure that we have it. Yeah. Can I hear it well? The problem is here. Externally, are there specific? Yeah, well, I, I'll take a three or four in the future if I, if I can. They are trying to, they are trying to find that point. Now. 
hating age. Tell me, supposing if uh, you push the thread from... Hello? Let him complete, sir. Nice if the, uh, there is a little bit light inside. Yes, that are not modified. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes, that's very, that's much better. Okay, now it's just Now, you see, when I talk like this, I forget the naturalization, which is not completely optimal in this case, as I told you, because. Yeah. Are there any landmarks for how much uh, lateralization there should be? Well, in, in this case, I will try to pull it out and I can find it from the inside because uh, the nuts deep below the skin and then under the skin and then you suture the skin. So you don't have anything coming out. Because this is a permanent suture. I mean, you cannot leave it up on a button or like this for the rest of her life. I mean, it has to be sealed inside the neck. Number one, do you want to do anything for the thyroid gland mother? Number two, Instead of one thread, the original technique described by uh, this technique is when the endoscopic lateralization was described. The original technique describes the detection of the medial thyroid gland muscle and cauterization of the muscle in the anterior to the posterior act. Would you believe in that? Well, this, this is what, what he is telling you is, is called the posterior cordotomy. So, if you have a laser at hand, this is the easiest way to medialize the vocal cord. It's much simpler than doing an arytenoidectomy. You just come at the level of the processus vocalis and you make your cut right through the vocalis muscle laterally and this will open the larynx very much. So this is, this is done in, in, in less than five minutes because it's just a simple cut. It's very quick and it's very efficient. Of course, complicated because then you have to pass your needle once and twice, and then you have a stitch. Not always easy. You push the thread through the needle, but the advantage of that is that it's not a very invasive procedure. You have two needles coming from out and then you put your thread inside. As you have seen, you have slight bleeding because you, okay, because you, you, tran you, you transpass the mucosa. 
Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, when it's, it's finished, it's probably one of uh, the lateralization procedure that is done in a, in a short time. It was not the case today, but because we had some other problems too. Uh, but the, the, the main concern here is that that lady, she has also internally uh, scar tissue. And any time that you do this, if the patient has been intubated, you should always look very carefully on the posterior aspect of the larynx. And initially, I tried to show you, you see that when you pull on the, the right arytenoid, the left one is slightly moving to the midline. And this should not happen if it's uh, just a pure neurogenic paralysis. And when it's a purely neurogenic paralysis, any cricoarytenoid ankylosis with scar tissue, so the medialization is much more efficient than you see on this case. I, I do recommend posterior cordotomy. The only problem that here we, we decided to show that technique first, but you could do a posterior cordotomy in this case as well. It's much better if you have a laser. If you don't have a laser, the problem with that lady is not too bad, she, she has a tracheostomy. But you have quite a few patients that have this bilateral vocal cord palsy without a tracheostomy. So if you use a cautery to do this, you will induce some inflammatory reaction and edema, and the post-operative period can be quite uh, difficult. So in such a case, if you just cauterize and, and section that muscle, it's, it's all right. But uh, for instance, in children, and I have talked about that extensively with Robin Cotton from Cincinnati. He's got such a great experience. And they say and they pretend that I have the same impression that this procedure is better than any of the other one. A recovery of the normal mobility. So it's, it's something that is, this is reversible, actually. If this lady says, well, my voice is so bad that I really I cannot stand it. I prefer to stay with the track and have a better voice. What you can do is just open the neck right here where you have your scar and you cut the thread and, and, and you pull it out. So this, this has advantages uh, uh, in comparison to other techniques. When you use a laser, when you cut, when you do the arytenoidectomy, posterior colotomy, it's gone. I mean, it's forever and you never come back. So this, these are advantages and disadvantages. So the, the quality of voice it does not the, the type of surgery you do. The, the quality of voice is dependent on the way you lateralize the vocal cord. If you pull more, I mean you have more gap, you have a better airway, but you have a voice. Some of the patients, they can comp compensate with the false vocal cord, and sometimes they get a voice that is not too bad, but just a bit low, you know. For a lady, it's not very nice, but it, you can handle it. Well, for a long time I have been doing... Yes, uh, the question for the audience, I mean, if you have a laser, do you prefer doing a posterior cordotomy or you prefer to do the endoscopic arytenoidectomy? So the, the answer is that for a long time I have done arytenoidectomies. When you do the arytenoidectomy, there are some very important points. You know, covering the arytenoid, you have the cuneiform cartilage. If you remove completely the cuneiform uh, cartilage, your patient is going to aspirate. So the posterior wall of your larynx should remain intact. What you remove is inside the larynx, and you should preserve, I mean, the whole ari epiglottic fold with part cuneiform cartilage up to the top and inside, inside the uh, cuneiform uh, cartilage because what you want to open is the airway inside the larynx and not make the communication between the pharynx and the larynx much louder than it should be. And if people claim that they have aspiration, it's because they make this fall. It's because they resect too much of the posterior wall of, of the larynx. Uh, it's the posterior, uh, the arytenoidectomy is, the, I think myself, it's a good operation, but it takes more time than the posterior colotomy. With uh, the, the muscularis process of the arytenoid laterally, you always have bleeders, you know, sometimes it's not so, sometimes it's not so easy. 
So when you have to coagulate that, you induce thermal damage into the surrounding tissue. When you do that, granulation tissue, restoring, and sometimes your bed of arytenoidectomy is full, filled with, with scar tissue, and you end up with the same condition, uh, except that it's even worse than, than having done the arytenoidectomy. So what we, we, we tend to do now is uh, building a flap with the laser, but you need a super pulse or ultra pulse laser, and then you lift up the mucosal flap, you dissect the arytenoid, you remove the arytenoid, and you flip back the flap inside the bed of the arytenoidectomy. And there you can use fibric glue and, 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 and put your flap very nicely, because where you don't want any granulation tissue, it's on the posterior aspect of the arytenoidectomy. So this is probably because of all these technical reasons that are not always easy to solve, that people have thought of, I mean, doing a posterior colotomy, which is very quick, very simple, and in, in a way, it's, it's, it, I must admit, it's, it's quite, it's quite, quite effective. And, uh, and but, but when you have transected the vocalis muscle, it's like removing the arytenoid because I mean, I mean, you, there is no way that you, you can restore the condition should I mean, the situation change. Uh, how long we are going to keep the tracheostomy tube after the operation? I think as soon as you scope the patient and you see that there is a decent airway, and for airway problems, most of the time what you have to do with the track is just ask your patient to plug the track during the day. You see how they are doing, I mean, you know, going up the stairs and so forth. And then when they do fine during the day, you tell them, okay, do that during the night and see whether you wake up, if you have problems or not. If this is uh, nicely done and the patient has no problem, you can decanulate your patient. So you don't even have, I think, to scope the patient to say, well, now I can decanulate the patient. The key issue here is you plug the cannula. If the patient is doing well with a plugged cannula, he will do well when the tracheostomy is closed. What, what I do if, if I have a recurrence after any of these operations. So if it, this is the lateralization procedure that we did with the thread, you have to see whether the thread has uh, broken apart, whether there was some, some technical problem. This is the first. If you have that after the arytenoidectomy, what you can do, you can go again with your laser and remove the scar tissue. But if you do... Same side. I, I don't like to work on both sides immediately, you know, because then aspiration might be a, more of a problem. But when you do this, now there is a new drug, a new medication that is very effective in preventing the recurrence of scar tissue. This is mitomycin C. Mitomycin C is a drug that was used as a chemotherapeutic agent, not very effective, not having side effects. So it has been almost abandoned. It was used only for palliative treatment in Europe, you know, when there was nothing else to do. But it was found out that it's very effective in preventing neovascularization, formation of granulation tissue, and it inhibits the proliferation of fibroblasts. An arytenoidectomy, and for some reason I have lost my flap or I cannot put a nice flap inside, I always use mitomycin. And mitomycin, you use it at a concentration of 2 milligrams per mil, and you just soak a cotton swab into that solution. And topically, just once, topically, you apply that for 2 minutes. So you just put your cotton swab soaked, I mean, it should be really soaked in, uh, uh, in, in mitomycin. And, and you leave that solution for 2 minutes. And it's amazing how it's, it's capable of preventing scars. Uh, the, for, for European countries, this drug is not very expensive. This is, uh, 20th century would be $17, $17 for a topical application. But if you can prevent recurring of scarring, I mean, for the patient, you can, see, you can save several further operations. Yes, 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 you can, yeah, if you have, if you have, well, you cannot preserve, I mean, the remaining of the solution for weeks like this, but, uh, I mean, should you have, 
uh, these type of problem, you, you just uh, plan your surgery with different patients on the same day, and then you do this. And so you can use the same solution for different patients. You get a lot of cases of stroma What's your experience with that? Yeah, with, with the mitomycin is, is also good, but the problem with the granulation in the tracheostoma it's also a question of hygiene. If the cannula is infected, I mean you will have recurrence. The problem with the, the, the granulomas around the tracheostoma is that you have a foreign body, and as long as you don't get rid of the foreign body, whether you use mitomycin, Mitomycin is going to work for a while, but then, I mean, everything is healed, and you still have, I mean, the irritation, chronic irritation from your formula. So you cannot expect, if you have not removed what we could call the foreign body, that this is going to be uh, much better uh, later on, because recurrence, this won't prevent completely recurrence, but it does help a lot to get rid of granulation tissue just before closing a tracheostoma, for instance. Most of the time you don't have to do that. You remove granulation tissue, you close and, and it, it's not a problem. Yeah. Excellent demonstration. But just explain us what size of it, what length of it, and how you feel when you pass the data, what points what, you take it to? I'm sorry for the demonstration that was not very clear, but we had so many problems running around. So what, what you do, it's like I showed you for type 1 thyroplasty. When you do the surgery for the first time, maybe you take, you know, uh, a pencil and, and then you will mark the skin, okay? And so, what you have to find out is the thyroid notch. You measure the distance and you make just half the distance and you draw a line. Improvement in endoscopic instrumentation. We have this Lichtenberger needle holder. This is a, uh, a needle holder that is slightly curved there's long needles like this, so you put your thread, what you have seen, from the inside out. So you do it, do it once, and then you can untie because, I mean, these needles, you can just pull the thread out and put the next thread, and you come below and above the vocal cord, and you come out and then finish the operation like we did. So it's much quicker because, I mean, you don't have all this problem of, of puncturing at the right place and finding and then pushing, you know, your, your thread into the, the needle, which is uh, sometimes a bit cumbersome, a bit uh, difficult. Oh, yes. Yes, and, and you put it around and you pull it back. But sometimes if, if, the, if the cartilage is calcified or that it's very difficult and then you pull hard and then you go to your thread. Uh, the question was uh, the size of the needle. I mean, you should always, I mean, before doing the surgery, check that the, the, the thread is passing through it. And of course, it's a bit larger, it's a bit easier from the inside to put your thread back. But this was an 18 gauge needle, and the length is about like this. So it's, it's you don't need the distance is not very very long. I mean, you have a very fatty neck, so you take a longer one. But uh, but any any really a needle will do the job. Three zero proline. You should not use resolvable sutures unless you do that in specific cases in children where you see maybe neonate. It's a it's a good idea, you know? He's, he's talking about the needle that has a steel inside, so you can push, I mean, your thread, and then you pull it back. So it's, it's, much, it's much easier. The only problem that you have is the needle is much larger. So sometimes when the, the cartilage is calcified, and uh, I mean, the injury that you do to the mucosa is slightly uh, bigger, but it's, it's a good idea. You can, you, you can use that if you have these type of needles, you can use them, definitely. The scrolling can go through. The optimal lateralization doesn't stay longer than that. <coughs>
Well, but you, you have seen. It's very important when you say it cuts through, but it's very important that you put that at the right place. If you put that a bit too anteriorly, you'll have only the vocal ligament. What you want to do is pass with your needle below the level of the vocal cord at the vocalis process. And the second time, your needle should be slightly uh, posterior. So the thread is coming around the arytenoid. And so by doing that, I mean it will hold better in place. Well, the chance of aspiration does exist with all these lateralization procedures. As I told you, with the arytenoidectomy, it's very important to keep it as high as possible in the back of the larynx. With this, it's only inside the larynx. So some of the patients, they have slight problems. You should be always very careful when you have patients with neurological problems that before the surgery already have slight difficulty swallowing. This is, this is very important. So in the present case, uh, would you have like to do something more for the scar tissue or part of the diet? Yeah, well, there, there has been, the, the question is how can you get rid of the scar tissue in the interarytenoid region? I think in the laryngeal work, this is probably one of the hardest uh, problems to solve because most of the time you will have recurrence. When you don't have any recurrence, it's because the mobility of the arytenoid is still but very often you have that bilateral vocal cord palsy and also interarytenoid fibrous tissue. In her case, maybe at home what I would have done is maybe combine this procedure with some laser work uh, on the posterior commissure with topical application of mitomycin. It has been shown on animal models that the mitomycin is capable of preventing adhesion of the arytenoid or phycoarytenoid ankylosis when you make an injury with a laser at the level of the joint. Yes, well, you know now the business of mitomycin is increasing and increasing and people are trying to use now mitomycin for a lot of different indications endonasal surgery when you have, you know, a fraction of the frontal nasal duct, people have tried to put mycomycin there. For coenal atresia, when you do that with the carbon dioxide laser to prevent recurrence of the coenal atresia. And of course, you, 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 you can do that. I did that in a few cases. I have a picture I can show you tomorrow where I didn't put any silicone keel and it did work quite well. I mean, not perfect, but, but I mean, much, much better than we used to do. So for me, there is an era before and after mitomycin in all this problem of scarring of the larynx. Sometimes when you get what you can achieve with that, just the carbon dioxide laser, but you have to have this super close technology or ultra close technology, no heat diffusion into the surrounding tissue. You apply the mitomycin topically, then you have some kind of beautiful results. So it probably is going to the indications for open surgery in the future. Not for a grade three or four, subtotal or total or fraction of the sublogist. I mean, this is always an indication for surgery. But for minor stenosis, probably you can get rid of the problem now with the laser and, and mitomycin.